the last four questions are going to use this diagram here. And so 15, 15 on your paper. Let's start in on this, OK? It says, if the monopoly is not allowed to price discriminate, then consumer surplus amounts to what? All right. So the monopolists can't price discriminate. So what do they do? All right. What price will make them the most money? Well, we go to our old standby. Marginal revenue equals marginal cost. All right. There's marginal cost. There's marginal revenue. That takes us down to 200 units of output being produced. All right. And so now we know the monopolist is going to go up to the demand curve and charge a price of $25. So this is what, if the monopolist can't price discriminate, that's where it's going to maximize its profits. Right? MC equals MR, up to the demand curve, this price. The question is, what's consumer surplus? Well, you know that. You know that this area, the difference between people's willingness to pay, that's the price they're willing to pay, $25 is the price they actually had to pay. So all of this is gained to some of these buyers, right? These buyers represent people who value this good at a price that's higher than 25. We are capturing that area right there. Another triangle for us, okay? So what's the area of that? Well, you have the base is 200. So we have one half times 200 units times this distance right here, which is $10 which is going to be equal to $1,000, all right? So the consumer surplus under no price discrimination is $1,000. Next question. If the monopoly perfectly price discriminates, the consumer surplus amounts to what? Well, what do you mean perfectly discriminate? Well, that's what I was trying to tell you in that example before with Best Buy. I don't know if you bought it or not. Um, no pun intended. So anyway, here's the demand curve right here. Here's the price that would be charged. In other words, the monopolist is going to find every person on this demand curve and charge them their willingness to pay. All right? And therefore, there's going to be zero consumer surplus. Because this person before who was willing to pay, let's say, $34, the monopolist charges them $34. And this person who was willing to pay $26, the monopolist charges them $26. And this person who's willing to pay, in essence, $17, the monopolist charges them $17, right? But every time the monopolist charges this particular person a price, and the price exceeds marginal cost, then the marginal revenue of that particular sale is equal to the price in this case, all right? So the consumer surplus is zero. There is none. The monopolist gets it all, totally. That's number eight. Number nine. If the monopoly firm is not allowed to price discriminate, then the deadweight loss amounts to what? Well, again, no deadweight loss problem. I can't discriminate. I have to charge a non-price discriminating price and produce at that level. Again, I go back to my profit maximizing point, produce 200, charge 25, and the question is, well, what happened to consumers? What would have happened if there had been a perfectly competitive market? If there's perfect competition, price will be equal to marginal cost, will produce 400 units, Okay, and the price will be $15. So the question is, well, what did that cost consumers? What's the loss to society of having a monopolist run this market? All these people who are willing to pay a price higher than the marginal cost, in this case $15, couldn't buy it. Marginal cost shows you the, the opportunity cost of using these resources to produce this particular good. People are willing to pay more than the marginal cost, mean they value it at more than it costs society to produce it. All this, folks, is... Deadweight loss. So now you've got the deadweight loss, call it in, and now you have to compute another triangle, right? Triangles become pretty important in this section of the uh, course as well. So we've got this triangle right here. We know the base is 200. We know this, this distance right here is 10. So now deadweight loss is equal to 1 half times how many units? Times 200 units times what, 25 versus 15, times $10, lo and behold, it's also going to be equal to $1,000. So the deadweight loss in this particular case is going to be equal to $1,000. All right? So if I look at problem number 10, it says, if the monopolist can perfectly price discriminate, then what's the deadweight loss? Wait a minute. What happens here? Again, the monopolist is going to charge everybody their willingness to pay. Right? They're going to charge every person what they actually feel 
this good is worth to them. How far will they do that? They'll go all the way out to 400. In other words, there is no deadweight loss. Why? Because in the extreme case in which the monopolist can actually price discriminate perfectly, charging everybody what they're willing to pay, every consumer gets the good they wanted, but there's no surplus to the consumer. There's zero surplus. The monopolist gets the entire surplus, and yet society gets an output of 400 units, and everybody who is willing to buy it at $15, everybody purchases it, at a, albeit at a, at a price that's higher than $15, but they purchase it because that's what they value it at. And so there's no deadweight loss. All right? Again, why would you do that? The point is, because we'll, we'll talk more about this in class and stuff, that price discrimination can actually increase or decrease deadweight loss because the monopolies can actually charge people what they're willing to pay. Example, take the elderly. Again, go to the movie theater. If I charge $13 a ticket, a lot of the elderly aren't going to go. And the marginal cost of showing the movie in the afternoon is Maybe zero, or just not much, right? You run the camera, or you run the projector, whatever it is, and if people are sitting in the audience, great, but you're going to run it anyway. So why not try to get as many people in there as you can? Because if your marginal costs are relatively constant, you can get elderly to come in in the afternoon, pay the $7 for the small price ticket. You won't make a lot of money, but at least you'll make their money. If you charge $13, all those elderly who wouldn't buy it at $13, wouldn't be willing to pay $13, won't show up. So you gain, you the monopolist, by price discriminating, okay? Drug companies do it when they sell drugs at lower prices in Canada versus the U.S. because it's illegal to bring drugs across the border from Canada. Not because of safety reasons, necessarily because of what the drug companies are telling them, because it makes really good money for the drug companies. They get to price discriminate. So they can charge a lower price for Lipitor, for example, in Mexico, because Mexico is not as rich a country as this, as this country is. They'll get more people to consume Lipitor. The marginal cost of producing more Lipitor is minimal. Once they've made the discovery and got the drug, producing more of it is actually rather trivial, all right? You know that because the generics can produce it for relatively nothing. So in other words, price discrimination is extremely profitable. But to be successful, you have to be able to segment the markets. You can't let people go to Mexico, buy lots of drugs and bring them back, and then undercut you in the United States. So price discrimination depends crucially on the ability to segment markets. And so there's kind of like, uh, not perfect, but sometimes other kinds of price discrimination. Right? I, want, uh, I want tourists to distinguish themselves from business travelers. Who's a business traveler? person who flies on Monday and comes back on Tuesday. That's a business traveler. What am I going to charge them to go to LA and back? I'm going to charge them a thousand bucks, 1200 bucks, right? Because I think I know their business travel. I know that the person who's on that plane is not paying for it themselves. The company's paying for it. They would need this badly. They don't plan ahead. This meeting came up quickly. He's got to fly to LA. I'm going to hit that person for 1200 bucks. But if you're willing to stay over Saturday night, I'm not going to charge you $1,200 because you're kind of communicating to me that you're a tourist or you're a leisurely traveler or whatever it is. But the people who stay over on Saturday nights on weekends on a cross-country trip tend to be people who are not doing business. All right? And so you'll charge them the $350, $400, $500 it is to get them on the plane. So price discrimination goes on in many, many, many different segments. All right? Take off-peak pricing. If you're in Metro North, right? why does Metro North charge a larger price between 10 and 2 because there's less traffic, less people, you're trying to encourage people. Same thing with weekend prices. So you'll start to see price discrimination everywhere. It's a way that firms can actually get more customers to purchase their good. And so long as the price is above the marginal cost here, their extra revenue tends to, certainly is greater than the uh, extra cost it's worth doing, they add to their profits. All right, that's all I'm gonna say about monopoly in this little segment here. I think we've covered the basics. Optimum price and quantity, deadweight loss and the monopoly, and price discrimination, the three big themes we're going to be working on in Chapter 15. So let me stop here. We've got uh, one more video to go, one more chapter to go, Chapter 16, and uh, we will have made it through this course. Thanks.